Thank you once again for joining us this morning at Tabernacle Baptist Church. We're delighted to have you along with us and delighted for the opportunity just to open up God's Word to see what it is that He would share with us today. We have a God who delights to make Himself known to those who are in passionate pursuit of Him. And so thank you for your desire uh, to know a little bit more about your God even today. The text before us is in 2 Corinthians We'll be in chapter 5, first 10 verses of that chapter, just as we read uh, during the song service today. I remind myself of, of some of the enjoyable things that I've been able to do in the past, and one of the things that I really enjoy is hiking. Uh, in fact, some years back, my wife and I were able to take a week and uh, just hike along the Appalachian Trail, and it was glorious. We uh, didn't have too much in the way of hiking gear and camping gear at the time, and so we borrowed uh, a tent from one of our good friends, and it was, uh, you know, one of these specials that you get at Target or something like this. It was fine, uh, maybe not top of the line, and this, this fine tent, you know, uh, a couple of days in, we had a good rainstorm, and it revealed to us that it was aesthetically pleasing, but maybe not quite as functional as we had at first hoped. And as the, the rain came down on us there uh, at, at the night, we, we decided to not just have the rain fly, but our rain jackets tucked above and maybe uh, rightly position a bowl to catch some, some water in there. And, and we were reminded that, you know, as beautiful as this tent is, it's not quite like home. And, and that as enjoyable as it was on the trail, uh, you know, it's, it's not quite like being home. And, and when that week got over, I remember, boy, what, what appetite I had and, and what joy it was to be home. And we got home and we, we showered and I thought, wow, it's so nice to be clean. And, and, and laid in our bed and thought, whoa, it's so non-lumpy. And, and it was a marvelous week. <laughs> but may I say, it was good to be home. See, as we approach this text today, especially in these first five verses, we, we start to learn some of the beautiful things that God has in store for us, and it comes into stark appearance that there's really two different mentalities that are out there. The one is something of the mentality of, of a nomad, uh, this person who doesn't quite mind the tent, doesn't quite mind to travel around, and, and in fact, goes from one point on the journey to another and never really arrives at home and has learned to uh, tolerate and accept the tent. And then there's, there's another mentality. Someone who, while they enjoy the outdoors, they understand that this is not their home and that they, they return to the city. And when I say citizen, I mean the one who dwells in the city, hence the name, that this, this is someone who knows that there is a more permanent dwelling for them, a dwelling not in isolation but in community, a, a dwelling with stability, a, a dwelling where you don't have to worry about the rain coming in. You don't have to worry about the snow landing on your tent and the tent collapsing under the weight of it. Another testimonial on that one. You, you have something a bit better. With that in mind, would you pray with me? And then we'll get into the text. My Father, what a glorious truth it is that you are preparing something better for us. Lord, you are our God and we glorify you. We thank you for that. And so I pray that you would open our hearts right now. I pray that you would wet our thirst for something more permanent than what we have right now. Lord, that we would long for home. And I praise you in Christ. Amen. Verse 1 begins like this. We know. Now, there, there is something to be said for this knowledge. Uh, and when the Apostle Paul uses this, what he's doing is saying, we have already taught you about this, and so I'm reminding you of what you have already learned, and so I may use that in shorthand phrase, we know. Much like a teacher says, hey, let me review with you for a little bit. I know you know this, and, and then he proceeds from there. The apostle says, we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, pause. Now, you and I are beginning this sermon in chapter 5. Uh, editors of yesteryear decided that we would put a chapter right here, chapter 5. 
This is a great time to remind ourselves that the chapter headings, the verse headings, are not inspired. They're just customary insertions. And it's nice. And so when I say turn to chapter 5, verse 1, guess what you do? You turn there as opposed to open the scroll, continue to open the scroll. And you're like, where, man? So it's good. Uh, nonetheless, we're kind of right in the middle of the thought of the apostle. And so if you would go back to chapter 4, and really this thought begins even further back than that, but at least track with me. Chapter 4, verse 16. Don't lose heart. Well, why? Though our outer self is wasting away, it's decaying. Our inner self is renewed day by day. Isn't that the same thing that we read here, chapter 5, verse 1? This outer self, this tent that we have. Now, when we start talking about this tent, leave it to a tent maker to use a word like this. We have in our translations, destroyed. Really, you could take that same word and translate it this way, torn down. Look. Morning comes, and you got to strike the tent. Like, let's, let's go. We're, we're going someplace else. And, and he's saying, we understand that this tent, this outer man, this, this clay pot, if you go back a little bit earlier in chapter 4, it's temporary in nature. It's, it's going to get torn down. It's inevitable. We have a pretty good rolling average of 100% of the time. <laughs> the tent gets torn down. It's just a matter of time. So with that in mind, with, with this idea that we know that the tent will be torn down, there's a couple of attitudes that come to the forefront. Verse 2 says this, and, and you'll notice that I skipped some of verse 1, so I'm going to return, and we're going to talk about something different in just a moment. But verse 2 says this, In this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. And you're going to find a number of different words here, and all of them have this idea of, of home, whether it's dwelling, building, home, house. And we're longing for that which is permanent. In fact, the, the current state of our being is, I'm just groaning for that which is ahead. I, I understand that right now I'm, I'm dwelling in darkness. I'm looking through a glass darkly. We're trying to live out as wise as we can this life, and it's just awfully confusing sometimes, as we read the chapter before. We're perplexed. Sometimes. And it's, it's kind of the type of life that leads us to groan at times. Uh, if you were to read a little bit more of that psalm that we opened with, Psalm 56, you'd, you'd understand a bit more of the heart of the psalmist and the heart of his God towards them. Man, God holds your tears in his bottle. Not one of them falls to the ground without him knowing. And in fact, he doesn't even let them fall. Praise the Lord for His goodness in these things. But we groan because we're longing for something a little better, a little more permanent. Verse 4 says it this way. While we're still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. I mean, maybe you just said amen while you sit on your couch right there. You're like, yeah, it is a burden. We've got all manner of burdens. Uh, the quarantine is a burden. We want to get back out again. Work is a burden. There's, there's maladies of the flesh that are a burden. There's the interpersonal dynamics that are sometimes, you know it, a burden. And all of this conspires together to say, man, I, I'm just groaning right now. I, I just understand the temporal nature of this. In this tent. You know, there's another word you could use for tent. Uh, and members of this church ought to know it well. The word is tabernacle. Uh, that... In fact, you could celebrate the Feast of Tents, the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. And it reminds us of John 1.14, that Jesus Christ, God Almighty, very God of very God, He tabernacled among us. He tented among us. Now, your translation might obscure that a bit. It might say this, that Jesus dwelled among us. Well, that's fine. It's a dwelling. And we beheld His glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Isn't it something that for all of this groaning in this tent, Jesus says, I'll take that tent. I'll enter into your sorrow and your grief and your pain. <laughs> of all the claimants to be God out there, 
Which one voluntarily entered your suffering? It's a short list. I know of one. In this tent, we groan being burdened. Well, why? We continue in verse 4. Not that we'd be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal, that, that this body right now, it is mortal. Last week, we spent a good amount of time talking about just this uh, folly in which people misprioritize their life, and they spend so much time on the clay pot. That was the metaphor last week. Tent, that's the metaphor this week. So here we are, man, putting the seam seal around the tent, putting that spray silicone on the tent. What are you going to do? Paint the tent, buying fancy pegs for the tent, and the whole time, you know, that's fine, right? But let's get home. Let's, let's go to the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, right? That, that, that there are better things ahead. So now, let me go back to verse 1. And, and I know the apostle, as he wrote, was just kind of going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Sometimes I like to just say, this is what he says about this, and this is what he says about that. So now we're talking about that. This is, this is the heavenly home. Back to verse 1. We're going to run through it again. We know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building. Well, that's a great news. The, can, can you feel the difference right here? The tent, I can set it up. The wind might blow it down. I have a building. And think of this ancient Israelite architecture, stone upon stone. Some of the buildings are still with us today. You still see the foundations of them. May I say, none of the tents of those days have survived, right? And yet the rock upon rock building does. We have a building. Not made with human hands. Not that we have this building in heaven because we somehow have tried so hard that we somehow ha have, have clawed our destiny out of the wheels of entropy, right? You know, you read some of these people from yesteryear, and they, they have this language like this. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Okay, that's fine. That's all well and good, except it doesn't count for eternity. That by your own efforts, you can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. Nothing of eternal consequence. Uh, you, you can have all manner of busyness right now. I mean, isn't that, you know, uh, the whole reason for which we live? So it seems by conversation. How are you? I'm busy. Good. I mean, of that busyness, what survives the fire? Of that busyness, how much is of eternal consequence? And if it's not in Christ, the answer is nothing. Now, in Christ... <laughs> May you be productive. But even more than productivity, may you love your Lord. May you sit at the feet of Jesus. May you pray. Well, that would be glorious. We have a building. It's not made with human hands. And unlike this temporary tent, verse 1 tells us, it's eternal. You don't have to worry about it fading away. When God says, I give you eternal life, it is by definition eternal. It's not the type of thing where God says, well, here it is, and I'm going to take it away from you if you're not quite good enough. No, it's, it's durable. It lasts. It's eternal in the heavens. That, that we know that this present terrestrial ball will be at least reconfigured, if not completely obliterated, whatever burned with fire means. And that God will create a new heavens and a, and a new earth. And when he says it's in the heavens, he's saying it's secure. It's by God. But understand, better things are coming than what we have right now. Skip verse 2. Let's go down here to verse 3. If indeed by putting it on. Putting what on? Now, he's changing his metaphor slightly here. It's a building. You don't quite put a building on, do you, right? I mean, that's a lot of weight, and that might just crush you. So we're going to change the metaphor, right, because we're talking about a, a heavenly body. You'd call this earthly body, this flesh and blood right here, you'd call that a tent. And, and the heavenly body, the resurrected body, think 1 Corinthians 15, think Jesus 
post-resurrection, that, that this resurrection body could be considered as, as a building because it's so durable, because it's eternal, because it's in the heaven, not made with human hands. But let's talk about it in terms of, of clothing. Because maybe in our mind we think, well, wait a second, I, I shed this body. Well, am I going to be naked? And the point is, no, in fact, you will be not naked, verse 3, you will be further clothed, not unclothed, further clothed, verse 4, that this resurrection body is, in fact, more glorious. It's not that this death will deprive you of something. It's that this death paves the way to what God has more fully desired for you. Except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abides alone. You think acorns to oak trees right here, that there's something better ahead. Well, verse 4 says it this way, that what is mortal might be swallowed up by life. Are you alive? You know, we have the the first installment of this right now. In verse 5, God says, look, I, I know this is a glorious truth, but it's God who has prepared you for this. He has prepared this for you, both and, right? If, if you were to recall John 14, Jesus says, look, if, if I go, it's good. In fact, verses, chapters 14 and 15 and 16, he begins to talk a little bit more about the Holy Spirit in those chapters in, in the book of John. But in chapter 14, Jesus says, I go, why? Do you remember? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You can't get there except by me. Well, that same Jesus who said that is now saying that God is the one who's preparing us for this very thing, this resurrection body, this heavenly home, this eternal dwelling, this in Christness for all of eternity, and he's given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee, as a pledge. If you're talking about realty, buildings and such, you could use this word, down payment. Well, the down payment is a guarantee of more payments, right? It's, I can only afford 20000 now, but let me tell you, I got a lot more thousands coming your way, and it's going to keep coming as a mortgage, right? The engagement until death, <laughs> until you die. Uh, think twice before you get a home loan, right? Well, well we, we want that same kind of language here with the Holy Spirit, that this is coming. This, this is the down payment. This is the engagement until you die. It's the guarantee. Now, I never want to pass up a good opportunity to teach on the Holy Spirit. What a misunderstood area of theology, or, or better stated, what a misunderstood person, member of the Trinity, very God of very God. And we've gone two ways here. On the one hand, some people say very little about the Holy Spirit, and on the other hand, people almost obsess about the Holy Spirit. And, and so let me just take a moment and, and kind of correlate with a couple of other scriptures and, and glorify God. So the Holy Spirit is the one who delights in glorifying Jesus Christ. That's what he says in John chapter 16. Uh, Jesus talks about his own departure and that when he goes, the, the Comforter will come, the Paraclete. Uh, Jesus will go and the Holy Spirit will come. That, that very God of very God will, will end up indwelling us. We read that in chapter 1 of Second Corinthians. And that his, his goal, his, his delight, his joy is to glorify Jesus Christ. Now, that seems as though that flies in the face of, of much of contemporary American, really global theology these days in which people want to glorify the Holy Spirit. And and really, his point is to glorify Jesus Christ. And so you would best glorify the Holy Spirit by following suit, by glorifying Jesus Christ. So much so that if, if we have a, a whole movement of the Holy Spirit that is focused on the Holy Spirit, oddly enough, that perspective is off by the very words of Christ, of the Holy Spirit. With that in mind, you know, he wrote you a book. It's the Holy Spirit who is the one who 
leads the inspiration of the Scriptures. Remember what Peter tells you? That these, these holy men of old, these prophets of old, they were born along, carried along by the Holy Spirit. And, and that is how we have this book come to be. That when Isaiah wrote, it was because of the work of the Holy Spirit. That, that as Paul tells Timothy, every word, pas, grafe, theanoustos, that, that this is all God breathed. Well, that's the Holy Spirit going on right here. It's his book. So if you want to hear from the Holy Spirit, guess what you need to do? Not partake in Eastern mysticism and throw a little bit of Jesus dust on top. Not sing the same words of the same song like at least 50 times. And because we've come to realize that maybe the words aren't enough, maybe we'll just sing the melody and, and just keep on doing that and doing that. Okay, look, I, not to speak too hard on that, because read the Psalms and there's repetition. I, I get that. But you want to hear from the Holy Spirit? Read what he tells you in his book. Sanctify them with thy truth, thy word is truth. And the Holy Spirit, the same one who inspired, is the same one who opens our minds, illuminates our soul. That's in 1 Corinthians 2. You can read verses 14, 15, 16. Actually, start at verse 12 and keep going. And that he is the one. Nobody understands the mind of God except the Spirit of God who is within him. And therefore, the natural man, the one who's unsaved, really doesn't understand Scripture. But you can, saint. And you can, sinner, if only you would repent and acknowledge that you can't do it on your own. If only you'd be humble. Leave off that pride which kills you. If only you would say, oh Lord, I don't understand. Would you please open my eyes, open my heart? God loves that prayer. That contrite spirit, he loves that you would recognize you can't do it on your own. Yes! That's what we said last week, right? That the surpassing power might be to God. Well, it's the Holy Spirit. What does he do? He doesn't help you bark like a dog. He doesn't help you run circles around the auditorium. He doesn't help you fall in conniptions on the ground. He doesn't help you slap the person next to you. He doesn't help you giggle until you cry. That's not what we're talking about. What he does, he gives you a book. He helps you understand the book. When he talks about he convicts the world, he convicts all people of of, of sin and righteousness and judgment, he does it through his book. It's his book. (laughs) So if you want to hear from the Holy Spirit, why don't you hear from the Holy Spirit? Read, study. Well, he, he helps us pray, right? We talked a lot about groaning in verses 1 through 5 right here. That in this tent, we groan for a variety of reasons. And if you read Romans 8, you really get that same picture. Uh, you could start all the way back at verse 17, really, and keep rolling in, in this text. But at least 26 and 27, it says that, that the Holy Spirit himself, because he hears our groans and the groaning of creation, he himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep even for us to understand. You have an intercessor. You have one who takes what it is that you're feeling and and makes it known in the very throne room of God. That God intercedes with God for the people of God, the children of God. You have a God who knows you, who cares. The one who holds your tears in his bottle. That's the God we serve. Well, he helps us to pray. Not only that, you you look at Acts 4. You know, the, the tongue's happens three times in the book of Acts, and all for various reasons. It's another sermon in itself. But typically we think, oh, spirit, tongues. Well, what about this? Oh, spirit, boldness. And again, it's boldness to do what? Uh, To laugh till I cry. No, no, no. Boldness to maybe have conniptions on the ground some more. No! It's boldness to proclaim what? The Word of God. It's Him making known to you the Word of God so that you could proclaim the Word of God and really glorify Jesus Christ because that's what He loves to do. You search the Scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. That's what Jesus said to really religious people spend a lot of time in the Word. And it's all about Jesus. Remember Luke? Jesus says that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He expounded unto them in all all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. All of this points to Jesus Christ. That's why the Spirit loves to point you back to his book. And therefore, we would boldly proclaim Jesus. When you're filled with the Spirit, you act a little bit more like Jesus Christ. It's the Spirit of Christ after all, right? These three are one. It's the triune God. Well, of course, he comforts us, right? 
You have the comfort of the Holy Spirit. That's the phrase used in Acts 9, 31 right there. Uh, and it's not surprising. I mean, his name is the comforter. He's the paraclete. He, he's, he's our advocate. Well, this is not an exhaustive list. We could spend a lot more time right here. But, but at least to help us orient our minds that this down payment that we've received, this seal that we've been given, this divine seal that we have, that, that we have very God, a very God dwelling within us, that's glorious. And what it should do is drive us back to the Word, back to our knees, and out in proclamation of the gospel of Christ. That, namely, there is a manner of life that is expected, that is predictable for those people who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And really, that brings us to our next point. That this walk of faith not only has a mindset of a citizen, not a nomad, but that this walk of faith, it's marked by Christian virtue. Now, virtue is a, a, a funny word. We tend not to use it as much as we should. I hope you're virtuous. I mean, the point of Christian education is to help instill virtue into those that you teach, to raise up citizens, right? To, to, to help men have chests, not these hollow-souled individuals, these glorified tools who are just equipped to do a task. Now, we want something a little bit better. Christian, are you virtuous? Well, if you're in Christ, you must be. And if your virtue is flagging, you ought to pause and ask yourself why. I mean, the same apostle who wrote this also wrote, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith, unless you fail the test. It's not my job to tell you, oh, look, you're saved. It's your job to handle that with Christ and to say, dear Lord, I am yours. Well, in light of all of this, really, certainty of salvation, that we know it's, it's of grace from beginning to end, like chapter 3 said, that, that we with unveiled face were, were beholding this glory and, and we're being transformed into that same image from glory to glory. I mean, the whole thing's glorious. The whole thing's of grace, beginning to end, right? Well, because of all that, we, we have a certain response. It's, it's a little bit predictable. Verse 6 says this, So, we're always, big word there, always, of good courage. It doesn't mean that we never have a lapse in virtue. We're still sinners, right? I mean, Romans 7, who will deliver me from the body of this death, right? Same guy that wrote this. Yet, we're always of good courage. Doesn't mean we never have a moment of cowardice. I mean, you look at Ephesians chapter 6, whole armor of God. Then you get to verses 18, 19, 20. He's like, pray for me that I'd open my mouth boldly as I ought to speak. Why? Because maybe it was a little bit hard. When he writes Timothy, he's like, Timothy, be bold. Well, I, I get it because you and I have that same struggle. And sometimes we're not as bold as we should be. And sometimes we're brazen and we call it boldness. Well, we want to have that humble boldness, that courage which rightly aligns with the other Christian virtues. Always of good courage. But we've been building up to this. Talk about the uh, unfortunate chapter divisions here. Go back. Track with me. If you've got your Bible, you'll flip a page or two here. Go back to chapter 3, verse 12. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. And, and therefore, we talk. We, we let the message out. And so Paul's telling these people at Corinth, yeah, I said some hard things to you. There are things you didn't really want to hear. But praise God, you needed to hear them and you changed because of them. Chapter 7, more on that in a little bit. Come down here to chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, remember, you are a servant of the king. You are a minister. You are a dispenser of the truth. Having this ministry by mercy, being mercied by God, we do not lose heart. Chapter 4, verse 16, so we do not lose heart. You catching a theme right here? So here we are in chapter 5, verse 6, so, so we're always of good courage. Well, why? Because what can man do unto me? That's why. Because we know, tear down the tent, and what do I have? I have a building. What are you going to do? Send me to heaven? That's why. And so we're always of good courage. If your focus is on the tent, if your focus is on the clay pot, you're not going to have this kind of courage. Or 
you'll have a courage that's based on your own good deeds. That's, oh, look how good I am, therefore I'm courageous. But it won't be courage, it'll be brazen. It'll be this impossibly righteous way of going through life that's so off-putting to everybody around you. It's the older brother type of mentality over in Luke 15. That's not what he's talking about here. Or, same thing, if it's depending on your own good works, you're going to be crushed because you fall for far more than you care to admit. And, and you're going to say, I, I, I can't do it on my own. But if you have the perspective that you have a building not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, that's such a good thing, and therefore you can have this good courage always. And you see it again, verse 8. It's really kind of bringing his point to a wrap. We've talked a lot about good courage, and so verse 6, courage, verse 8. Yes, we are of good courage. Well, are you courageous today? What bold thing can you do for Christ today, this week? Maybe you might want to start just thinking on a day-by-day basis, what courageous thing have I done today? You know what that might look like? For some of you, that might look like I got out of bed. That's very courageous, given a certain set of circumstances. That's almost unspeakable courage. Here's where perspective comes in. Sometimes we look at what is for someone else remarkable courage, and we look at it with disdain because we just don't have eyes to see. Uh, If you were to go back into the Old Testament uh, and read the book of Zechariah, which I love, by the way, Zechariah is all about the Messiah. And you would read about one of the leaders uh, and Zerubbabel. He picks up a plumb line and all of heaven breaks loose in rejoicing. It wasn't even a hammer to hit something. It was a plumb line. He picked up a tool whereby you measure something. Now, if you and I looked at that, we'd be a little underwhelmed. Uh, If you are an independent contractor and you have people working for you and they're like, boss, I picked up a plumb line. (laughs) You'd be like, that's great. Um, What else do you got for me? You you don't want to necessarily say that on your interview, right? Uh, This is my resume. What do I do? I pick up plumb lines. And people are really amazed. Not really. But everybody in heaven broke out in joy and rejoicing because they knew it was a harbinger of better things to come. Because the final product never will materialize without that first step on the journey. And for some of you, you'll have remarkable courage because you pick up the plumb line. That you get out of bed. That you do that which Christ has called you to do. Even though it's very hard for you, and even though it's very simple by perspective from someone else, but you know what God has called you to do. Well, speaking of knowledge, verse 6 continues, we know, we know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. We have certain things that we know. Verse 7 says this, we walk by faith, not by sight. I want you to, to take those two ideas and put them together in your mind. I believe what God says, therefore I know My knowledge is based on faith. By the way, all knowledge, inescapably, of whatever philosophy, is ultimately based on faith. Many people choose not to follow their logic to its beginning place and therefore do not see the relationship between faith and knowledge. We have a faith, therefore we know certain things to be true in this world. And no, we don't have an unreasonable faith. It is, in fact, very reasonable. And as we explore, well, what does our faith look like? We see very reasonable evidences for our faith. But we do walk by faith. Are you virtuous? Do you have this faith? May I say it this way? We are all people of faith. What do you believe? We all are walking by faith. Faith in whom? Your faith, if you're going to test it, must have an object, and that object must be valid. We know. We have faith. Verse 8, we'll read this a little bit more. It says this, yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home 
with the Lord. Uh, it's really parallel to what we read just a couple verses early, right? I mean, right now we're at home in the body and away from the Lord. Frankly, I'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And that's our desire that we would just long for our Lord. And, and another word for this you could just say is hope. That you have this certainty that better things are coming. That leads us to verse 9. And verse 9, in some ways, is, is the statement that would characterize all the rest. So, whether we're home or away, doesn't matter where we are. It can be here, it can be there. It can be right now, it can be later. Whatever the case, this much stays the same. We make it our aim to please Him. That's why in 1 Corinthians 13, faith, hope, and love, these three remain. But the greatest of these is love. Well, love never fails. Love will not be done away with. Love is the most durative of all of these things because faith, one day, it will be sight. Well, we don't walk by sight now, but one day we're going to see Him. We'll be like Him because we'll see Him just as He is. One day hope will be realized, but love, oh, love endures. And we, we get to love our Lord right now. And I pray that you would learn to linger in the presence of your God. Sometimes, sometimes we get so bent out of shape in, in this Martha world of ours. And if, if we're called upon to linger ever so slightly more at the foot of the Savior, it just throws us all out of whack, doesn't it? Why is that? Did you ever pause and reflect on that? Why is it that we have such a hard time learning to linger? Well, are you virtuous? This brings me to the last point. That's verse 10. It says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And so the walk of faith, it really has a destination. It leads us to and you might almost say it leads us through uh, because this is sort of a passageway to all the glories beyond, but, but it leads us to or it leads us through the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm going to call it the Bema seat. That's what it would be called in Greek. And the idea here is that this is the place where uh, the judge would sit, uh, that the magistrate would sit, and, and the case would be brought before him and the decision would be made. And you could rule this way or you could rule that way. And I want to tease this out because some people have some, uh, maybe some wrong ideas about this and maybe some undefined ideas. And so here's at least a brief recounting of some of the things. You see in this text, we must all appear. And so the first question is, all. Does that mean all the world or does that mean all my audience? And so who is Paul talking to? He's talking to Christians. And granted, they're Christians who struggle. Probably a lot like you and me. They're Christians who are good repenters. That's a great thing. They're Christians who are trying their best to serve Christ, and, and they're falling down doing it. And he says, look, all of you Christians, and he's including himself, we all, each one, all of those who are saved must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This does not entail all those who are lost, all those who are not saved. There's a different judgment. It's called the great white throne. You can read about it in Revelation and elsewhere. For our purposes right now, we're talking about a a judgment, an evaluation that is uniquely for those who are saved, for the children of God. What is this like? It's, it's certain. It says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not something that maybe you might avoid. All of us will pass through this. And it's, it's a compensation. And it's a perfect compensation. The righteous judge, the one who is thoroughly just and simultaneously gracious and full of mercy, chooses to reward us. And that grace and mercy is on full display right here. I mean, what, what do you have that you didn't receive, right? And so even here, you know, these, these crowns that we get, we lay them back down at his feet because we recognize that even those good things that we do are accomplished by the energizing principle of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that, that we are taught what is right by the Word of God, that, that we are drawn up out of spiritual death by the hands of God. Not, not that I 
chose him, he chose me. Or better said, I chose him because he enabled me to do so. I mean, all of this is true. Nonetheless, God, even here in grace, is able to show some reward. Now, I, I'll give you a couple of illustrations here in terms of references. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15 and 4, uh, verses 1 through 5, talk about this same judgment seat of Christ. They use a couple of different words for it. Uh, in chapter 3, it's as though we are seeking to build something. So, similar metaphor terms, but in a different use than what we see here in our present text. And so, it's as though throughout the course of your life, you're making something. And you can make it with uh, gold and silver and precious stones, or you can make it with wood and hay and stubbles. And so maybe what you do is a very uh, industrious nothing. That maybe you are eagerly and earnestly doing temporal work. And it gets put through the fire. (sighs) Well, you'll be saved. But so as by fire, you suffer loss because of those things. Maybe some of you else, you, you are prayerfully, prayer is the word, and patiently because it's of God, not of you, but zealously never lose your zeal for souls. A peculiar people, zealous for good works. Isn't that what our God says of us? That, that we're doing all of these things and that, and that you are putting all of your righteous rigor to the task at hands, and sometimes that means sleepless nights because you're earnestly trying. It's not as though, uh, on the one hand, you have this uh, zeal that counts for nothing, and on the other hand, you have this like uh, mystic who just kind of sits around and does nothing, maybe get to the top of the mountain. It's really not at all it. It's that all of your work now is being redeemed for glory. And so you go out and you're a cobbler and you make shoes for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Or you go out and you're an artist and you write songs for the glory of God, good! And you write fiction for the glory of God, good! May you exemplify the virtues in your literature. Good. You have all of these things. The point is, why are you doing it? Yes, also, what are you doing? But why are you doing it? For whose glory are you working? I mean, these are the questions at hand. Well, the judgment seat of Christ is coming before we know it. In fact, with all of this, we're almost home. You know, you don't quite know how long you have until the day that you are called and that you face the judgment seat of Christ. It's really good if you examine yourself, (laughs) and that really prepares you well for the examination. And it's kind of the awards ceremony right here. And, well, it's really great to receive the award. And you're not necessarily kicked out of the hall or kicked out of the banquet, but, but when what you thought was so valuable is burned up, there's loss there. You, know, you read Revelation, there, there will come a time when Jesus will wipe away all the tears from our eyes. We're not really told a lot of the whens. I wonder, I could be wrong here, I wonder, uh, maybe if this, you know, there's, there's this loss. There's this loss. I mean, the next verse says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. I mean, there's a sobering reality. Some people, some people seem like they take some of the teeth out of this. There's much we don't know. Here's what I do know. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, It hasn't even entered into the heart, the mind of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I do know this. It'll be glory. I do know this, that our momentary light affliction, read the previous chapter, it's not even to be compared with the glory that is to come. I know that God loves me. I know that God loves you. What do you know? There's some questions that I want to ask you guys as as we kind of think through this. We walk by faith, not by sight. Well, if we walk by faith, then I guess my questions all will have this in common. What do you believe? I mean, we're all people of faith, but faith in what? Faith in whom? Faith to what end and for what reasons? So what do you believe about tents, about 
buildings. What do you believe about being clothed and unclothed? What do you believe about clay pots and surpassing glory? What do you believe about mortality being swallowed up by life? What do you believe about all of that stuff? And really what I'm not asking is for a textbook answer. A man truly believes not what he recites in his creed, but only those things for which he is ready to die. So wrote Richard Wormbrandt, founder of Voice of the Martyrs, in his book called Tortured for Christ. What do you believe about all that? What do you believe about the Holy Spirit? I mean, are you sitting there trying to master some sort of emotional manipulation and corresponding somehow your emotional up and down to your standing with Christ? That's a roller coaster. And therefore, when you had your your prayer experience and maybe you didn't cry as much as you did two weeks ago, Therefore, you think, well, maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe there's sin in the camp. I, I must be... What, what's going on with this? What do you believe about the Holy Spirit? Do you believe that the Spirit wants to guide you into all truth through His book that He wrote for you? Well, if you believe that, maybe, maybe you would study the Bible a bit more. You say, I, I have such a hard time reading. Well, maybe you could listen to it. You know, probably more people find it easier to listen to the Word than to read the Word. That's okay. There's, there's no shame in that. And so listen to the Word. And maybe you might want to take a chapter, and you might want to listen to that chapter two, three, four, five times and pray through that chapter. Psalms are wonderful for that. And as you go through the psalm, man, be still, my soul. Be still and know. What are you going to do with that? Well, your belief about the Holy Spirit will really determine a lot of the things that you do in life. Do you believe that you were sealed when you were saved? And that seal is irrevocable. Well, there's certainty in that salvation. What do you believe about the judgment seat of Christ? Do you believe this is the place where you just might lose your salvation? Well, that that does all kinds of hard things in your life right now, doesn't it? But what about this? What if eternal life actually meant eternal? What if that building that God has prepared for you has been prepared for you? And what if it is a gift, in fact, not something that you do to earn? What if you can be a little bit more like the younger brother in Luke 15 and come to your senses and go to the Father and just enjoy the fatted calf and enjoy the Father And not spend all of your time pursuing the gifts and neglecting the giver. I mean, what do you believe about the judgment seat of Christ? Now, for all of those questions and more, frankly, we need to ask this last question. How does this affect your life? Your belief always determines your behavior. So we can run that equation the opposite direction. Your behavior provides you a really good window of insight into your beliefs. So, what are you doing? How do you spend your time? How do you spend your prayer? Those are going to tell you some things about what you believe. Now, here's the good news. Your beliefs can change. That you can align your beliefs with what God reveals to be true. And that as you have your mind renewed, You get to put off this old way of life and put on this new way of life and that your walk by faith can really be different as a result. And you can begin to understand and experience things like the joy of the Lord that is my strength, not determined by situations and circumstances, but by the ever-present indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. So what will you do with all of these precious promises today? Will you make it your aim to please Him?